You may be saying, preacher, what do you mean introducing Jesus? I've known Jesus for 50, 60, 70 years or more. I've known, I've walked with him. But we're going to look at him anew today. You know, there's a phrase, familiarity breeds contempt. And while we don't have contempt for Jesus, hopefully, familiarity can also breed complacency where it becomes so second nature to us that we forget kind of the specialness or the power. And so that's what I hope today as we look at this passage from the first uh, chapter in John, reminding us just who Jesus is and what he did for us. So let's start reading John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet... To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Join me in prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, thank you for your scripture. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that works within us to help us understand and then apply your scripture to our life. Of course, Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ, and we ask that you would open our minds and hearts as we study your scripture today to refresh anew upon our minds and hearts who he was, what he did for us. Not that we just revel in him doing for us, but that we understand our responsibility before him, and we develop a deeper desire to live for him and to serve him. Help us, Lord, to say as John did in a later book, we love him because he first loved us. And so we ask that you would open minds and hearts, Lord, and be with us in a powerful way. And it's because of Jesus' name that we're gathered here and we pray. Amen. If you've been listening to sermons, many lives over your life, many years, much of this you'll probably be familiar with, but we're going to refresh it. We're going to go through in the verses, in the beginning. In my mind, I don't know if you've ever asked this question, but what beginning? Well, it's not talking about Jesus' beginning. He's eternal. God's eternal. He always has been, always was always will be. There is no beginning or end to God, to Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, to that Trinity. So it's talking about our beginning, the beginning of our world, the beginning of our universe. And so he's saying that in our beginning was the word, and the Greek word there is logos, and it can, it's like a lot of languages, if you've ever studied a language, it can be difficult to translate or transliterate, but that logos means uh, an overwhelming wisdom, insight, uh, understanding. But that's what it's calling Jesus here. In the beginning was the Word. And you can say, well, how do we know this is Jesus? And you go down and you look at verse 10. It said, He was in the world, and though the world came to him, through him the world did not recognize him, he came to his, that which was his own, and yet his own did not receive him. 
And so it, later on it gives that explanation that we are indeed talking about Jesus Christ. But He was in the beginning. He was there at our beginning. And the Scripture goes on to reinforce that. One, it makes that statement that He was God, and that was, of course, what put Him at odds with the Jewish leaders of the day whenever He asserted that He was God and that He had come. Uh, and that was blasphemous to them, but He is God, universal. And then it says He was with God in the beginning, and not only that, through Him all things were made. There's a kind of a hierarchy here, a division of of work that goes on here. God is the creator. It's through him as the father that, that things are spoken into being. But this teaches us that all that work was done through the Jesus Christ. He was instrumental in the actual creation, in the, in the actual put, putting together of it. He was there. He wasn't just a, a bystander or a spectator, and he certainly wasn't created after the fact. He was there in the beginning with God. He was involved in the creation with God. And we also know the Holy Spirit was there in Genesis. There at the beginning we have and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters of the deep. So we have the three of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit present at creation, each performing their role in that creation to bring it to fruition. Continuing on after verse 3, in Him was life. We, one of the truths that we really need to grasp hold of is because of Adam and Eve's sin, because of uh, that falling, we are all born into death, death to the things of God. Our spirit is, is, is dead to God. And it is only as God uh, breathes into us, as He did initially with Adam, that breath of life, that pneuma, as He uh, quickens us to a life that we become cognizant of Him, we become aware of Him. And once having become aware, we can hear the truth and respond to it about who Jesus is. But we start out... In death, but Jesus was that life. He brought life to us. He made it possible to have life. All through the Old Testament, the people were taught how to live a righteous life before God. They were given rules to follow. They were instructed what to do. But the sad part is, is if they could have followed those 100%, it still would have not brought them Life, because life comes through death. The wages of sin is death. It is a penalty that has to be paid, that disobedience to God. And yet we were not sufficient to be able to do that. Jesus Christ had to come, take our sins upon Himself, and be death for us. And I forget just exactly when it came to me, but it just overwhelmed me when I really thought about what Jesus did there on the cross because He took the sins upon Himself of everybody who had ever lived up until His time on earth. I don't know how many millions of people that must have been that lived and many of those trying to live a righteous life, trying to live obedient, but could not see heaven, could not have a relationship with God because their sin was not covered uh, by the blood of the Lamb in perpetuity. They would do sacrifices that would uh, cover over it and be a shadow of the cross, but it had to be done year after year and it never was sufficient. So when Jesus died on the cross, when He was on the cross, took those sins, He took all the sins of everybody who had ever lived then he also took the sins upon everybody who was alive at that time. And again, who knows how many millions of people were alive in the whole world when Jesus was there on the cross. But that wasn't the end of it. He also took the sins of everybody who was ever going to live until that time that God says 
the end's come, it's over, and called it to an end. So Jesus took the sins of everybody, past, present, and future, upon himself. It wasn't just those people alive at the time. It wasn't just for us in the future. All those people who had lived, who had strived to be righteous before God, needed their souls redeemed. And Jesus did that, and certainly everybody at the time, and then all of us to come. And so as I ponder over that, and I think about that weight that Jesus took upon Himself, the number of of souls and sins He took upon Himself to take to the grave, is it any wonder that the Father could not look upon Him? And in that moment that God, Jesus felt that abandonment because His Father that, that sin on Jesus, which had never been there before, created a, a schism, however brief, and he cried out to his God, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, he was forsaken in that moment because of our sins upon him. Thankfully, because he is God, he was able to take those sins to the grave. He was able to leave those sins in the grave. And He was able to rise again to eternal life. And through that, we have that hope of resurrection. So that's what He did in Him was life, is He brought us life by death, by His death. And it's a, it can seem a barbaric, uh, a, a barbaric happening in our sensibilities today but it's necessary, and death is often necessary for life. If you want to, uh, if you want to grow something in your garden, you bury a seed in the ground. We know that forests thrive uh, when a, a controlled, the right kind of fire goes through to clean up the brush. It actually frees the good foliage to good life. So it is necessary in order for a life to come. And Jesus Christ did that for us. He who was without sin, who knew no sin, became sin for us. He took that upon. And uh, we don't like admitting that, but it's a very logical, cognizant thing. We know we do things wrong. And those of you who are parents know that you didn't have to teach your children to do wrong. When you told them, no, you can't have a cookie, and turned your back, they'd be in the cookie jar. When you told them, no, don't cross that street, you'd turn your back and they were going across the street. They, there's a natural drive, a natural nature to seek what oneself wants. And that's what is driving all of us. That's what drives our children. We don't have to teach them. Now, unfortunately, later, they start learning our bad habits. And we hear a word out of their mouth, and where did you hear that? And, Daddy did that, or Mommy did that. But they learn habits from us, yes, but we didn't have to initially start teaching them that. It's part of our nature, and that nature needs to be atoned for. And Jesus Christ came and did that so that we could be free from the power of sin. We could be free initially from the penalty of sin, then the power of sin, and one day we'll be free from the presence of sin. We'll go to be with Him in heaven. We won't have to deal the travesties and the uh, har horrors we see in our life today. We won't have the abuse going on. We won't have the heartache because He will bring all things to an end and to fruition. So this life was in Him. And it goes on to say, given us many descriptions of who He is, that that life was the light of men. Sin is related to us being in darkness. We can't see. We don't see God. We don't see our sin even. We don't even know we're in that mode because our eyes are blinded. We're living in darkness. But when Jesus came, He is the light of the world and, and His light illuminates the truth. And when we see the light of Jesus Christ, it illuminates the sin within us, the wrong within us, and we don't like that, and we often hide from that. But when we will accept the truth that He's not coming to condemn us, He's not coming to put us down, He's coming 
to bring light into our life, to bring understanding, to bring truth, to bring life, and we accept that, then we transfer from darkness into light, into life. Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness is not understood. And if you don't have that Holy Spirit within you, if that, if that spirit, that connection to God is dead, you can't understand the things of God. And so it is very often, it is very justified that a person who has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, when they hear these truths that we share, and we share what happens in our life, they don't understand. It doesn't make sense to them. And it's not going to make sense. It's like trying to tell a, a toddler about trigonometry or calculus. Or you may say, it's like telling me about calculus or trigonometry. It's ununderstandable because they don't have the light to see that. And Jesus brought us that light. We're living in darkness. We can't understand it. And then it takes a little parenthetical phrase here. Verse 6, there came a man sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify. John, of course, was Jesus' cousin, born some nine months before him. And God had laid his hand on him. He came through a miraculous birth to his barren mother. And God called him into the world to be that, that for telling of Jesus coming and to start proclaiming the word and John recognized Jesus when he saw him and knew who he was so that's who John is he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all men might believe he himself was not the light he only came as a witness to that light that was coming in the world then it goes back to Jesus with verse 10 he Jesus was in the world and even though he was in the world which talking about creation that he had made that it was made through him but the world also is a as a metaphor for all of us and especially for all of us who do not have Jesus Christ in their heart that's known as the world the worldly nature and so Jesus came unto those of us in the world, he came to his world. And even though he made us, he made everything here, the world didn't perceive him as that. They didn't recognize him. They didn't know him. And so he had to continue being proclaimed. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own. Talking about who he created, but also talking to the Hebrew children. The people God selected, he came and Jesus said, I have come to proclaim to Israel the gospel. And that's where his heart was. That's where his mission was. He was giving them one final time to, to claim him as Savior and Lord. And it grieved his heart. And we had that famous verse that Jesus wept when he came and he looked over Jerusalem. And he, he knew his kindred people the Jews were not accepting him as the Messiah, and it broke his heart. And he, his heart breaks over those of us who refuse to accept him. But, it says, to all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. John was that first prophet to come foretelling about Jesus and then Jesus came and Jesus got the disciples and at the end of Jesus ministry he released the Holy Spirit uh, when he went to heaven the Holy Spirit came and we have that passage in Acts where the Holy Spirit descends upon the people and they start proclaiming the gospel and sometimes in various tongues and different languages so that everyone there could hear the gospel and respond. It was released throughout the world. It was taken not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles, to the barbarians, which is what we were considered, so that everyone could know Jesus Christ as Savior and everyone could proclaim the word of Jesus Christ. And those who heard the voice 
could become children of God. They needed to believe. The work that Jesus did was efficacious for all. It, it could apply to all. It was available to all. God, I, I do not believe I am not one of those who believes that God has chosen certain ones for salvation and others for damnation. I believe that what Peter wrote, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all might come to eternal life. I believe in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And God is desiring that each one would come to know Him, would accept this light, would accept this truth, would allow Him to come into their life, to redeem their soul, to make it possible for them to be ushered into heaven on that great day, and to have abundant life here on earth. That's what He wants. The Bible again goes on in verse 13, uh, just anchoring this down, that it's a special birth. These children of God are born not of natural descent. It's not through normal human lineage, nor of human decision. Nobody decided to bring, uh, make that happen, or a husband's will. This birth is the birth of God. It is God coming to us to make known to us the need that we have. And that's where we need to get beyond the complacency of familiarity that we can engender uh, by having lived with these stories for so long. And we need to uh, re be reminded anew of our position in Jesus Christ. You may have walked with Him 50, 60, 70 years, or maybe 30, 40, or 20, uh, however long it's been. And it's true for you, and it's always been true for you, but we need to get back to that basic understanding that at one time, we were dead to Christ. We were hopeless. We had no hope within our strength, no matter how intellectual we are, no matter how smart, no matter how capable, no matter how strong, we did not have the ability to, uh, to achieve the standard God placed in our life, and that standard is perfection. God says, be ye perfect even as I am perfect. Perfect means no mistake ever your whole life. And I know I can't do that, and I know you can't do that, and I'm not being critical of you. It's just that human nature drives us towards that. So we were hopeless in having salvation until Jesus Christ came and paid the price for our sins. And so it is, it is very helpful to be reintroduced to who Jesus is and to His work on our life. And it ought to, when we, when we really get that, the 18 inches from our head to our heart, it ought to be a, a life-changing event again as we respond. And it may, uh, I, I often think, and I actually pray the prayer like Isaiah did, where Isaiah says, Woe to me, for I am undone, for I have seen God. And I just think, Lord, let me see you. If I could see you, and the scales drop from my eyes, as we say figuratively, poetically, if I could see you clearly for who you are, what you did for me, without any shading of my human nature, of my uh, intellect, of my uh, uh, scientific basis, sophistication, if I could just have that experience of seeing who you are, what you've done, I know that I, like Isaiah, would fall down and say, woe to me, for I am undone. We have an inflated ego about ourselves. And it's unfortunate, but too often we may think that we deserve what Jesus did for us. And I'm a pretty good guy. I try to treat people right. I, I try to do right. And, 
it, it's just after all, it makes sense that God would come for me. Or, well, sure, I'm one of his creation. Sure, he wants to do that. But it's much more depth than that because, because of that sin nature, we are at enmity with God. And we have a sentence of eternal death upon us. And he, through his powerful grace and mercy, set into motion that which was necessary for our sin to be covered. And it was done through the blood of the Lamb. It was done through Jesus Christ. So without John chapter 1 and these verses we've read and Jesus Christ coming, we would all be doomed to a life of separation, to not have his help. And his help is real. This morning I heard a testimony from one of you. Uh, not that that was the only one, but it was this morning about how there was this great burden and the, the release of being able to give that over to God and know that God had it. Not that the answer came, but just that sense of knowing that they were in his hand and that that burden was lifted. That's real. I've experienced that myself. You've experienced that. Uh, there's healing. God is at work and alive among us. He's at work within this church. He's drawing people into ministry and service to Him. And God is working. And so it's all real. And if we will just get back, be reintroduced to Jesus Christ, of who he is, what he's done. And it may be that you may have grown up in the church. You may have sat in these pews for a hundred years, but you don't know him today. You see, it doesn't matter what mom and dad believed. It doesn't matter how much you put into the plate. It doesn't matter how much work you've done to take care of the church. All that's good and proper, but what matters is that relationship with Jesus Christ. And have you come to that place in your life that you know that you are apart from Him and that you need His forgiveness, you need His, His uh, redemption, you need Him in your life, and you've accepted who He is, that He's the Messiah, that He is God, that He has come and died for your sins, and you yield that to Him, and then you are living for Him. That's what matters to God, is that you've accepted His Son, Jesus Christ, as your Messiah. My son and I were talking yesterday, we saw, well, Friday, we saw him Friday, we are visiting, and he was bringing up how he had heard somebody recently talk about that 70% of the people in the pews don't know Jesus Christ as Savior. They, may, they worship, they attend church, they are good people. And I said, yes, I've heard that before. Billy Graham used to say that, that 50% of the people in the church do not know him as Savior. So we cannot rest on those kind of uh, 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 laurels that we're right with God. And the question that I ask people is I have opportunity, two diagnostic questions, is one, and I, I asked somebody this week this, this very question, if right now you were to die, your heart quit, whatever it is happens, do you have the complete assurance, is there any shadow of a doubt that if you died right this minute, that you would be in the presence of Almighty God. You should have that kind of assurance that you know if that last breath is gone, you're with God in heaven. If you don't know that, it's something for us to talk about. The Bible says that I have come that you might have life and that you might know you might have life. Jesus Christ is the truth. He's, he, you can count on what He says. And so that needs to be uh, just an incontrovertible knowledge to you that you're in the hands of God and you know you would be ushered into His presence. But then there's another question that's important. If that should happen, and, and we're counting on it not happening, but if that should happen and you should breathe your last for whatever reason, 
And if you imagine that you're standing before God and he says, why should I let you in to my heaven? What would you say? If you try to say, well, I've lived a good life, that's not the right answer. If you try to say, well, I was grown, I was raised in the Baptist church, or I went with mom and dad, I was baptized, that's not the right answer. The only answer that satisfies God is I believed in your son as the Messiah, that he died for my sins, I've received his forgiveness, and I've made him my Lord. That's the answer. If you don't have that assurance that if you breathe your last, you'd be in the presence of God, need to talk with someone, and let's get that settled. Also, if you're under the mistaken opinion that you're going to get in by your good works, by what you've done, you need to go back to the Word and see that our works are as filthy rags, Isaiah said. And so Jesus Christ came so that you might have life. He came to illuminate your life with truth. He came that you might be forgiven, redeemed, and then filled by the Holy Spirit to help you as you go along. And then He's given each one of us the task to tell others about Him. Stand with me in prayer, please. We're going to sing a song of invitation, a hymn of response. Come ye sinners, poor and needy. I trust that you have had that occasion in your life to realize you are poor and needy and you've accepted the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Or perhaps today, as I preach these words and read these verses, something within is saying, this isn't settled. This isn't a done issue. I've been holding out. I'm still taking the reins. I pray that during this time of response that you would have that conversation with God to say, Lord, I do believe. I believe the truth. I don't understand it.